But if I keep thinking, all right, how do I learn and grow from this? How do I help others around me learn and grow from this? Whatever it is, whatever mishap, whatever surprise, whatever struggle, whatever success, how will I and how will others reach higher ground from this thing? Then I feel a little more at ease day to day because whatever comes my way and awful things have come, right? Deaths, it's a, whatever comes my way, I'm gonna find the path to higher ground. Hi there, welcome to another podcast episode of Seeking Voices of Healing, Hope and Health. I switch those around each time, don't I? But this time I have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Beth Frades. Uh, Beth is a pretty special person that I've known for years, but not actually spent time with personally. And it was such a pleasure to spend time with her uh, and connect with her on so many different levels here today. Dr. Frades or Beth is a pioneer in lifestyle medicine. She's actually the new president for the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Um, you know, she's a teacher at, at Harvard, um, at Mass General Harvard, where she teaches uh, patients to adopt uh, and sustain healthy habits. Uh, you know, many of the people I speak to focus on nutrition, but as I've mentioned to you before, um, I don't think it's all about nutrition that heals the body. And what I like about Beth is she really focuses on the whole spectrum of needs that the body has and um, the spectrum of needs for wellness. So in well-being. So, you know, she's a passion for wellness. Um, she had went to Stanford Medical School. She had did a residency at Harvard Medical School. Um, she's really been interested in stroke and stroke prevention. And she's been focused on wellness and well-being for decades. Um, and she's currently on faculty at Harvard Medical School and she teaches medical students, she teaches residents, she does online symposiums for doctors and really talks about the importance of the other pillars of wellness along with nutrition. So she focuses on the importance of reducing stress and focusing on love and connection. And one of the areas that I've been most fascinated about lately is uh, the social connections and the importance of love and positivity and growth mindset. And one of the things that I focus a lot on in my clinic. Um, so I'm really looking forward to having um, um, you listen and hear the great conversation I had with Dr. Frades um, and take a look at her, take a look at her book um, that she's written, um, take a look at a lot of her material uh, online and, and her website, which is Beth, B-E-T-H, Frades, F-R-A-T-E-S, BethFradesMD.com. Looking forward to hearing what you think of her. Drop me some questions if you have any thoughts. Hey there, Beth. It's so great to see you. Thank you so much for being on this podcast. You know, I, I really want to focus in on healing and hope and health. And you, when I thought about those concepts, I thought of you instantly because you, you're you working so much in this space. So thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you, Monica. I'm delighted to be with you. You are someone that inspires me from afar. So getting up close and personal with you is a delight. So thank oh, you. It's, it's so great. You know, I sometimes wish that um, we record the pre-conversation before we actually get into the conversation because for the last 40 minutes, it's been such a delightful time spending time together and connecting. And, and I guess that's what I would want to start with because you know, I think in this world, you know, we're living a lot on Zoom, we're spending a lot of time running around, you know, I have three kids, I'm running around as a doc, I'm just trying to figure out, and you commented on family logistics, and we're just trying to like make our life work. And we have then maybe during this space, we've sort of forgotten about the impact or the need for connection, because I call it, um, I call the feeling that I have right now, actually, as I run around like a, a person, I have this soft underbelly and I call the soft underbelly feeling this feeling where I'm just not quite there. Like I'm a little anxious and I don't feel, and I don't feel connected to people. Tell me about what your thoughts are on that soft underbelly feeling and why you talk about wellness or take it wherever you'd like. I mean, there's so many things I want to talk to you about. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. And I love the pillar of social connection. And if you know me well, you, you know that's true and that it's been a passion for me for over a decade. This idea of how do we create and cultivate high quality connections really around Jane Dutton's work that I dove into and want to further and build upon. 
because we don't talk about this really in middle school, in high school, in college, in medical school, in medical training. We learn so much about important material. And some of it is the pillars of lifestyle medicine. What does exercise do for your heart? We, we do learn about this. We learn a little bit about nutrition, not enough. We need a lot more, but we're really not talking about the science and art of social connection. And I know that you're aware that this has been on the radar screen in medicine and in research and in journals since 1979 with Berkman and Sign. Lisa Berkman's now at the Harvard School of Public Health, but she was in California and did that seminal study looking at nine years following men and women in different age groups. So I think it starts from 30 to 49 and it goes all the way to 79, different age groups, men and women, following them over nine years and looking at mortality rates. Now it was a bar graph that I have in my head that shows the people with the least connections versus middle level versus most connections. And it is the people, men and women in all age groups that had the least connections, they were the most likely to die in the nine years. So this was a calling back in 1979, wow. which, which to me says a lot because you and I are sitting here in 2022. And for some of our listeners, this may be the first time they've heard of this study. I don't know that it's mentioned in medical school, or in other health professional schools, but, but it should be. And we're here to, to try to change that uh, in lifestyle medicine. We do have our lifestyle medicine interest groups at, at Harvard, and I know I talk about it there, but getting real and having a conversation with you on this podcast about it and almost talking about some personal parts of it, I think could be even more powerful, for example, than the literature. So going into that space, I will admit that I, like my dad, who was a workaholic, <laughs> overstressed gentleman, um, I can tend to focus in on work because I love it so much and it's a passion and I love helping other people. And then I'm doing my family, as you, you mentioned earlier, you have family responsibilities and work responsibilities. And for me, those are usually my, my priority. And when my kids were teenagers, there was a lot going on. And I will say that I let social connections in my own life just, I guess, be. I wasn't cultivating them. I wasn't nourishing. Who has time for that? You know, we have no time for those social connections. Mm -hmm. But we need to nourish and nurture those. So fortunately, I had cultivated high school friends. One in particular, college, again, my college roommate and some from medical school. So I kept those during those tough years, but it wasn't until COVID that I said for my own self, I was doing my paving the path, the wellness wheel that Harvard Health helped me create the questionnaire. And I do it for myself, not just for my patients and, and colleagues, but I, I actually ask myself these questions, this self-report questionnaire. And I, and I make my radar plot. And I found that I wasn't connecting as much with colleagues as I really wanted to. Some research says, and this isn't an area of pure science. When we talk about the science and art of this, I mean, this isn't a pure science. You must connect once a, a day in order to be happy and healthy. And there's going to be also a, a personal approaches to this, but there is research that does indicate if you are connecting seven times in the week, you are more likely to report a higher sense of well-being. So, I mean, we can say at least let's look at connecting once a week with a friend, a, 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 a high quality connection. And I can say I wasn't doing that. And, and, and I certainly wasn't doing that in COVID. Um, and it was then that I said that I really need to do this for myself, not just write about it, but I need to make this concerted effort. So I started meeting with two dear friends and colleagues once a week during COVID. And it was a way to nurture my mind, my soul, my, my spirit, and to keep me inspired and going. We, we are all passionate about lifestyle medicine, but also moms, 
We were, we happened to be moms with kids and we could share some of the struggles that were going on during COVID, being a mom, being uh, a working mom, uh, being uh, passionate about our, our programming and lifestyle medicine. So I would love to also hear and have you share some of the insights you've had, because I know there are many. Yes. Uh, uh, no, I, I appreciate you saying that. So, you know, uh, you know, we started in on, in, on a deep topic and I, and, and I, and probably because for 40 minutes, we'd had this conversation beforehand and, you know, I would tell you, I think that people don't realize, I think that sometimes, and maybe that doctors, you know, they, they seem like they have it all together, or maybe because we're on social media and, and we look like we have it together. And so for instance, somebody sent me an email, a doc I work with at UF, he sent me an email. He's like, God, everything's going so well for you. I'm so happy for you. And I, I think that that's sort of an ironic because, you know, maybe things are going well for me or they're not going well for me, but that's sort of not the whole picture, right? So the picture that everybody sees on the outside is just one piece of Monica Agarwal. But there's the part of me that is starting to have joint pain again for the first time in 10 years. There's the part of me that feels anxious and I don't know why I'm anxious. Um, there's the part of me that's having kid problems with my kids where who brought one kid breaks an ankle and you go to school thinking everything's fine. Then you get a call that the, that the kid broke the ankle. And it's those unpredictable moments that are creating this, this anxiety and uh, like that, like I said at the beginning, that soft underbelly feeling. So lately, I've been actually being. I, I admittedly, I'm quite anxious, you know. And I, uh, I've considered this, and in a way, I've. Uh, why am I so anxious? What is it that is so anxiety provoking? And I think what I've come to. I mean, there's many things I've come to, and I, I think about it and analyze it, and I'm talking to people about it honestly right now because. I think that people, it's important for people to see that the person that everybody sees on the outside is not necessarily all the parts of me. And I have many imperfections and flaws. And one of them is, is that I'm, I'm working through this anxiety piece and, and I'm not afraid of it and I'm trying to understand it and I'm trying to learn from it. And so what I, what I think part of it is, is that it's that lack of control, isn't it? Like you, as we get older, so many more things are out of our control. Our own health is out of control. And, and especially for somebody like me, who's like, you know what, I, I, I do all the things that I'm supposed to do, quote unquote, right, but yet I'm not doing well. Why is that? And so that lack of control, I think really hurts. And I think that what I have come to about it and through journaling and meditation is that, you know, learning to lean in, uh, learning to lean into the moment and say that it's okay to, not be perfect and to not to have things not work out. Like, I think, um, you know, I'm a huge believer. I love, um, and I say his name wrong, but the beautiful Vietnamese Buddhist um, meditation, special um, yogi um, that he recently died, um, Tak Nick Ting, I forget Thich his name. Thich Nhat Hanh. Thank you for saying it properly. Um, and he said something that I, I always, I listen to a lot of his, um, um, some of his audiobooks. And one of the things he said is, is that you, that people have this perception that it's not that you're either happy or you're unhappy and that it's not about that actually, but because that you can have happiness and unhappiness at the same time and that they can live together. And so that reminded me and made me think about how you can have perfection and imperfections or good things and bad things at the same time. And I think those are the things that I would say that I've been sort of working through and remembering that it's okay to have imperfections or weaknesses or things that aren't going so well at the same time as things are going well has, has helped me and helped my anxiety because it makes me realize that I, I can't always be in control because life is not controlled and it's imperfect. And that also brings me back to why you and I are having such a nice conversation about connection, because one of the other things that I feel like I've lost since I've moved to Orlando is that social connection piece. And I feel like I've, I've missed out on having my besties right next to me who I can say, Hey, you know, I can't deal with da, 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 and not having those people nearby. And I think that I think that sometimes those anxiety feelings come up when we're in our own heads more and we don't have those people to kind of digest things with. Brilliant. I, I think we should replay that. <laughs> That's a great <laughs> point right there. I mean, all of it, <laughs> it's in the last part you just said, because as you were talking and sharing with us in this moment right now, I did think, well, 
you're being so real and vulnerable, and this is going to empower others, other physicians, other patients. And by the way, we all know this physicians are patients. So we'll just call it other people to lean in to their true feelings. And that may be of anxiety. And then it brings me interestingly to someone who taught me so, so much, who had really a high school education and didn't speak English very well, but was so, so helpful to me and so wise and continues to provide me with comfort in times of anxiety or surprise or conflict. And that person is Rose Gonis. And Rose Gonis came from Vassara, Greece when she was 18, had an arranged marriage to Peter Gonis. And they uh, came to East Boston and made their way here in the United States. And that's my mom, my grand, my mom's mom and dad. So my grandparents. And it was Rose, and it continues to be Grandma Rose, who passed away when she was 86, um, but continues to provide great nourishment and, and, and wisdom and just remembering her words. So one of the things that I was thinking when you were talking was making sure to have someone in your life like this brings us to social connection, how this anxiety, this soft underbelly and social connection actually are all connected is having that one person, that charismatic adult in your life as a mentor of mine, Robert Brooks, a psychologist here at Harvard Medical School taught me, his mentor was Julia Siegel who coined the term charismatic adult. So to define it the way Dr. Robert Brooks defines it is this, a person from whom you gather strength. So if we all have that person, and for me, it was Grandma Rose for the longest time. She, she passed away when I was in college, but, but having one person that you can go to when you are anxious, when you feel lost, when things are out of control, you can call them, you can go visit them, you could Zoom them. Uh, and you, you can have a heart to heart, you can really speak your mind, and then you feel better. Yeah. It's that hope and healing you talked about the first sentence when you introduced this podcast, that person gives you hope and healing. And this can help us in times of anxiety. Now, it's not the medication necessarily that we may or may not need or the, or the intervention we may or may not need, but it is helpful to have this charismatic adult and to think about who we are the charismatic adult for in in our lives we're, we're receiving it and then we're giving we it. There's, there's so much joy in the in the giving there's real importance though in in the receiving and for us as providers healthcare providers or, or parents or, or grandparents who are used to giving giving to realize that it's good to let others give to us when we are in that that time. Now I'll just share with you, and maybe this will help something that my grandma would always uh, talk about, which is having the sense of purpose in your life. What, what, what you were, you were born this way with these gifts, these talents, each of us were born with some gifts, some talents, every single person here listening has strengths. I, I would love for them to spend one minute right now, just thinking about what their own strengths are. And then the question was, what are you going to do with those strengths to make the world a better place? So how do you, in your short time in this planet, leave something behind that, that adds value, that, that helps people reach higher ground? This was the thing she would tell all of her children and grandchildren. And we would think about this sense, this sense of purpose and, and what we're doing. And look, we're, we're not going to cure cancer, all of us. Some may and will, and that's terrific. But Grandma Rose lived a great life and, and, and she was bringing joy and she was bringing empowerment to people that interacted with her in her own special way through her Greek restaurant that she and my grandpa ran 
I learned that people would come. It was a popular restaurant. I think my grandpa was quite a good was quite a good cook, but she was the hostess. And people would just come sometimes to sit with her because she would just listen. So part of the restaurant was like Grandma Rose and 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 Grandpa Peter's uh, cooking was on the side. You were really going to to have the experience of the listening from Grandma Rose. Back to the underbelly and the anxiety. When we get, when we connect back to our sense of purpose and literature is showing us with healthcare providers and physicians in particular, especially after COVID, losing that sense of, of purpose. So when we think, okay, so what do we really want to get done, Monica? What are we really trying to do here? Be a loving mother. Be a mother that is there to empower, to be that charismatic adult in our child's life, perhaps. That is what we want there. And then in maybe in medicine, we, we all have our, our areas. You and I are, are in you know, lifestyle medicine. So we're trying to empower people to adopt and sustain healthy habits. And when we think, okay, so what am I doing today to, to be that charismatic adult for the kids? And then the other purpose, right? To, to empower people to adopt and sustain healthy habits. And when we, when we tune into what is our purpose and then we start focusing in on, on that, sometimes that helps even to relieve the anxiety and that soft underbelly because it kind of puts us a little bit back on track to yeah. what our lives are. No, I, I think you said some, some great things and important. So, you know, what I take from that is I like the idea that everybody should find somebody who nourishes them and um, provides them with that sort of comfort and joy. Um, I love that because I think that that's super important. And I definitely have people like that in my life. And I think that people need to find those people, but also to remember that to also be givers too. And I think so many of us women in particular, though, we end up being givers in general, right? And you know, we give, I have three kids, I, I'm always giving, uh, I, you know, there's, you know, our patients, there's so many things we're giving to. And I think that what I like most that you said is that it's important to remember that we can't just continue to give and that we have to learn and be okay receiving because we need it too. And when you were sort of looking at COVID, you're like, you know what, I, I'm missing that piece. And because we're not, we're not used to receiving or almost we don't make it a priority to receive and, and that we need to receive some of that energy and joy and love and advice or whatever it is back as well. And, you know, your grandma sounds like the pretty awesome lady, uh, which I love. And I love that story so much. And, and I, I think there's so much to be learned from her, right? She gave people, she listened to them, she heard their stories and, and, and people needed that. And, you know, I see patients every, uh, every day and, and one of the things that, and people ask me, cause I, I was actually talking to somebody recently who's working, it's a design firm. And they, they asked me, they said, they're trying to design um, medical spaces to make them more connected and joyful. And I said, I think you're missing the point. And I said that one of the things that people aren't looking for, like a beautiful picture of hearts and, and love, that's not what people are looking for. People are looking for true and meaningful connection. And so when you come into my clinic, we there's there's that connection that bonding that we have and i'm sure in yours as well and and it's and I, what i have found that what people come to me for more so than my brilliant mind <laughs> is is that connection is that i just listen and i listen to people but you know sort of being able and I, i'm proud to be that for people but also to remember that we can also be receivers too and that we need to be receivers because as we give and our cup empties we have to also wait find ways to fill our cup and i think we as physicians and maybe we as women and we as moms um we often have a cup that's half empty or or and or more empty than full exactly again so well said and it brought me to a decade ago, it, it was, it's a memory that's clear as day. It's 2012 and it's October and I'm in my driveway and another mom comes to me with a dinner, a full meal for my family and I won't, won't receive it. Now, my dad had just died and he was 79. And my mom 
was 81 and clearly had memory problems. The dad was very much hiding. Even though I knew I had an inkling and I, I mentioned it several times, he always had a way to excuse it. At any rate, at this moment, my dad had died and my mom, I needed to bring her to my home for her to be safe, to live with me and my children. All my friends in my neighborhood knew about this, of course, because they we saw each other routinely at the kids' games, at the schools, and they were very kind and lovely women. And yes, I, I like to be the helper, and I did help many of them with their lifestyles and adopting healthy habits, and I loved doing it. I even had, at that time, a little program on the local evil station where I would coach people, you know, in real life, one, you know, uh, live one-on-one -on -one in the camera. So I had, I had a lot of friends, but in this moment, I was struggling. Absolutely. I was, yes. Mm -hmm. I was very, very sad to lose my dad. Very sad. I, he was a, a just a, a best friend, a, a mentor, a pillar of strength for me for my whole life. And then of course I, in a way did lose another best friend, my mom, because I, I really couldn't uh, communicate in that deep way anymore. So, um, and life changed and turned upside down for me, having her in my home with the boys. But I, back to the friend and back to the driveway and back to, I am not superwoman. And I, I will say her name and if she's listening, oh, please do email me or, or text me Sue Picking because it is you Sue Picking, it is you. Uh, her son and my son played Little League together. It was Sue picking in that driveway with that meal. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. You should keep it for your family, please, no, no. And she looked at me with all earnestness and said, Beth, I know you're a kind person and you're compassionate, but what you're doing now is you're not being kind and compassionate. And I thought, oh, what? You know, <laughs> and leaning in, really? What, what do you mean? And she said, well, I've made this for you. I, it would be, bring me great pleasure to give this to you and your family. And what you're doing is you're, you're not letting me help. When I help you, I feel good. I hmm. want to help you and feel good. And she, by the way, also shared that she had a whole schedule for the other moms to bring oh. meals. And I was like, no, no, no. You know, that's when I'm, no, you, you know, I don't want people worried about me. I don't want people, no, Beth, this is the way people will feel good. If you allow this to happen, you're letting them feel good by helping you. And it just reframed sort of everything. And, um, and I, I think that's, I think it's so beautiful um, and so true about so many of us that what you just said there about the box or the barriers that we put up and like you almost feel like you had to grieve alone, right? You you couldn't share your sadness or your maybe your weakness or your um, your vulnerability, right? And so many of us then live in this box and kind of privately grieve, right? And and it brings me to this beautiful man who recently died uh, and committed suicide. Um, uh, I don't know if he goes by just Twitch or. Um, but he was on the Ellen show and, um, was a beautiful man and just passed away, um, and had some mental health issues. And I, and I think about that a lot. I've been thinking about that over the last day and a half and about what you just said about this private grieving and how we have to, we, we feel like we can't show our vulnerabilities and we can't show, uh, our sadnesses. And yet, and that really, really makes me sad to see a beautiful man like that pass away, and I, I just, I'm so glad Sue Picking was there for you in your life at that moment to remind you that not only does she get something out of, uh, that gets joy out of giving to you and how uh, people want to be able to help, like they're looking for ways and that's important to acknowledge and nourish too, but also that you don't have to be some certain way. Like you don't, nobody, we all have things like you don't have to be somebody for the outside world to see that's different than the inside person. Like why can't the inside and the outside person be the same? And why can't we show our vulnerabilities to people 
and own them and lean into them. And maybe that's why I'm telling you guys, guys, I'm anxious. Uh, I'm anxious all the time and I can't, and I'm working through it and I'm trying to figure out. And even my husband will say, he goes, okay, you're anxious. Let's talk about it. Why? You know, like, it doesn't mean that every single person needs medicine or doesn't, or, and some people will, and there's no shame in that. Um, And some people will need medicine and some people won't, but just having the conversation and saying, and saying that's so much of the part of it. Like I'm anxious or this makes me sad, or I feel vulnerable or whatever it is that you're feeling. I think that we need to have more of those experiences and conversations and those kind of connections. And so what I, it always comes back to that. If we have people in our lives, those charismatic people, or even if they're, you know, that somebody that you can say, you know, look, like you and I, Beth, before this meeting, you know, I said to you, I said, I'm anxious now. I can't quite figure out why. And I talk about it and I think about it and I work through it and I'm, but I don't know, but having that meaningful conversation with you was everything for today. Right. And so, and I'm not afraid or embarrassed to say that because you've added and enhanced my life today. So I I thank you for that. Oh, Monica, thank you so much. These words, they, they touch me deeply. I, I know that there's the languages of love if you're familiar with that. And I am one with words, like words just that, that that's, that's, that's the thing that really touches me and the thing I try to give people, right? But thank you also for just sharing yourself with all your followers and the people that are listening to this podcast and who routinely do. I'd love to ask what, what do you think is is underlying the anxiety because i think you might know yeah you know one thing that i've mulled over a lot um and i think for me the fundamental problem is the lack of control and i i really feel that for so so when i had when i was first diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis i was put on meds and a lot of people know this story and and i had lost control for the first time and And when I sort of learned about how to treat my body by healing the gut and taking the right anti-inflammatories and really slowing down, I took control back. And I often say that I was empowered to change. And and I did for 10 years, I was pain-free. And so now here again, I'm starting to feel some joint pain again for the last year off and on. I think, well, why is that? And so that lack of control, and it actually started, I think actually even further back, if I'm being most honest, is when my husband got COVID, he also got shingles and he got shingles in his eye. And he's still dealing with that actually, because he got shingles in his eye, an otherwise healthy man who then got um, overstressed out because of many things that were going on. He was finishing his MBA and raising three kids and got so stressed out. He developed shingles and the shingles went into his eye. And I have a lot of weight on me that I missed it. I was a day late in getting him treated. And to this day, he developed, he has all this eye pain. And again, it's that, it's that lack of control. Like I, if I just gotten it a day or two earlier, maybe I would have changed his course or, and that he's still dealing with that. And I think that's when I started realizing. And then my daughter, she broke her ankle again, another lack of control moment. And then here again, now with my joints, again, just all these things happening that are putting me out of my control. And And I think that's what I I spent a lot of time journaling about actually is that, and what I also tell people is that you have to, you have to, boy, you have to sort of accept that it's okay to not always be in control because as we get older, for sure, no matter how many things we do right, things still may not be perfect. Mm, That is profound and really important to to digest, but hard, hard to digest and hard to accept. Um, I think maybe for somebody like me, uh, hard to accept is maybe the hardest, the, that's been the hardest part is that, okay, I understand it in concept, but actually accepting it, um, has been a challenge. Right. And what have been the ways that you found you could start accepting it just for your listeners? I bet they'll learn a lot here. Yeah. So, one of the things I um, I often say um, in one of the things I do is I have to accept what my body has to give. Uh, is something I say to myself a lot. Um, I do a lot of journaling and writing and uh, writing has always been a, something that I feel good doing. And so I actually recommend it to all of my patients as well. 
And I tell people to journal, but one of the things I always tell people to do to end their journal with is that they have to write things that they are good. Um, because I think so much of the time, and especially in this worry, anxiety space that I'm living in, we focus almost so much on that anxiety that we forget all the great things. And so I'll remember, and I remind myself, and I tell my patients, I said, write three things down that are positive and good in your life. And so, and I always tell people it can't be a negative positive, right? It can't be one of those, uh, I didn't do so badly today. That's what I call a negative positive. Um, but I mean something that says like, you know what, you know, I slept really well today, or uh, I love the way that person smiled at me, or uh, my kids are doing great, or whatever it is. And so those kind of things remind us um, what um, that same concept that we talked about earlier, that is that you can have happiness and unhappiness or perfections and imperfections at the same time. And, and that's okay. And it's okay to live in that space because there's no actual such thing as perfection or true happiness or whatever the heck that word even means. It always has other parts and it's okay to sort of appreciate and enjoy and love the parts that are great. And also the parts that are not great and love them together. Mm, a lot is there and it brings me to this slide I have in my head uh, when I talk about lifestyle medicine, I talk about stress resiliency and the evidence-based approaches and I give people 14. You can look these up, right? Oh, I love it. And you want, but guess what? One of them is expressive writing. That is an evidence-based approach to reducing stress. And I love that you are expressing that to all of your listeners and that you use it and that you share this. I will say that Suzanne Coven, Dr. Coven here at MGH, she talks a lot about the power of expressive writing for, for clinicians, for healthcare providers. It works for everyone. It then leads me to thinking about Marty Seligman and his very powerful work around gratitude. If you yes. recall, he looked at an intervention that was writing down three good things. And you do this, you say, do your expressive writing. And then you, you say the three good things. You may or may not know you're, you, you're building on or also using or calling up uh, Marty Seligman's great research and, and, and foundational uh, concepts as well. And, and he found that when people do this, they can enhance their sense of well being, And that is also what you've been talking about a lot here. And then when we think about this, what is well-being? And people use wellness, people use well-being. Really, it's this, you have a spectrum, right? You have disease where you're sick, COVID, as you were talking about. You're sick or heart disease or pneumonia or you're sick. You have symptoms, you have disease. Then you can get to a point of neutrality. We try to do that in medical school, get rid of all the signs and symptoms of disease, uh, treat it, intervene, give medications, get to a neutral point. Hopefully you've done some changes in lifestyle that will help you get to a neutral point. Now from neutral to this mm, vitality, thriving, higher sense of well-being, we really need education, growth, we need reflection, really looking at our six pillars. And that includes social connection, as you know, exercise, nutrition, stress, resiliency, use of substance, you know, that. but to get from that neutral to this other, which, which, which John Travis, he started really wellness medicine in the seventies in California. So John Travis, Travis uses the word wellness. A lot of us are moving to, to well-being, but it's this sense of something more than just being, <laughs> more than being in our neutral phase. We, we want, we all crave this vitality, this energized being. And I think a lot of it has to do with the social connection, everything you talked about, the vulnerability, being authentically you. And then I like to think of it as we're all well beings, right? We're, we're all well beings striving to embrace everything that it means to be human. And that includes struggles, successes, and surprises. And I talk about those three, struggles, successes, and surprises. And I think it is the surprises, lack of control, 
that gets people caught up and that's the one to work on in a way most i just want to share one concept because i know we're getting up on time but if can i share one concept i i i feel might help you and listeners i love it please do you know the concept carol dweck's work of growth mindset from stanford okay this has helped me tremendously monica i don't know if it'll help you and maybe listeners, it's, it's been written up when talking about burnout and talking about healthcare providers. It's been written up that embracing a growth mindset and being coached in embracing a growth mindset could really help because it, it actually really helped me because when I realized that mishaps happen, surprises happen, sometimes good, sometimes challenging. My son had a cuboid fracture. Your child <laughs> broke an ankle. These things happen both in a year to you and to me as a mom. And these, these now require, right? They, this required a lot to, to, take, to take on, a lot more responsibilities for both of us as parents. The thing about the growth mindset is any mishap is an opportunity to learn and grow. So for you and for me, with just, just call it these fractures. So for my son, he couldn't play hockey. That's his passion. He's at Williams College in the Berkshires, NESPAC school playing hockey. He loves it, but he couldn't play because he, so this was an opportunity for him to think about what else brings him joy. So let's look at this together instead of, oh no, what's this going to do? Oh no, oh no, oh no. So now it's, oh, okay, well, look at this. Let's learn about fractures and how they heal. Let's research what mechanisms could help you the most. Shockwave therapy at Spalding at Harvard. That's a new thing. Look at that. Let's investigate together. What else will you do in your time since you're not going to go to practice five days a week for three hours or whatever they do? What else? Oh, so you'll do more photography. Oh, well, isn't this interesting? So you'll start thinking about community service and how you can use your photography in that way. Oh, well, that's interesting. So, so it opened up just a whole that. new opportunity. So when we look at these mishaps, like my, my mom moving in, which that was, that was a blessing and I'm grateful for it. And I love her and I'm so glad we had that. And honestly, she got so close to my boys and they are different people because they cared for a grandmother. I don't wish it on anyone. It was very hard. But if I keep thinking, all right, how do I learn and grow from this? How do I help others around me learn and grow from this? Whatever it is, whatever mishap, whatever surprise, whatever struggle, whatever success, how will I and how will others reach higher ground from this thing? Then I feel a little more at ease day to day because whatever comes my way and awful things have come, right? Deaths, it's a, whatever comes my way, I'm going to find the path to higher ground with it. I love that. It's beautiful. Beth Frades, you are amazing. It's been a pleasure to have you. No, truly, uh, it truly has been a pleasure. And, uh, you know, I'm going to take a lot away from this today and a lot of thought. And, you know, I, I, I'm so glad we've made our, our, our connection so real and authentic today. And I look forward to working on things together. And I, I know that, our paths continue to line and will continue to line up. And I find that to be really special. And, you know, part of the reason I'm doing this podcast is to bring these connections for myself and for everybody else, but also to remind people that we all have the ability to heal and get better and, and that we're not going to always be perfect. And so I thank you so much for sharing so much. And uh, I, I definitely have a lot of things to think about from this meeting and things I'm going to write down today and kind of think about. So I appreciate you and appreciate your time and, and our friendship. So thank you so much. Thank you, Monica.